um, let me just tell you a little bit about this paper to get us started. Uh, our goal is to estimate returns to teacher experience for teachers of middle school students. And we're using administrative data um, from North Carolina. I should have mentioned, if I just go back, I have a co-author, Lucy Sorensen, who's a PhD student at Duke, who will be on the market next year, and uh, is terrific. Um, but in any case, um, we think we're making three contributions. Uh, one is careful attention to specification issues, um, and including attention to the specification of the experience variables themselves. Now, we're not the first people to do this. There's some recent work by uh, Matt Kraft and John Pape and by uh, Wiswell that I'll refer to. Second thing is that we're focusing on middle school students. Uh, as some of you may know, with colleagues at Duke, Charlie Klopfelter and Jacob Vigdor, I've done a lot of work using North Carolina data, but focusing primarily on elementary school students and some at the high school level. But this one's on middle school students. And then the third contribution is to expand our outcome measures beyond student test scores to include a variety of other measures that I'll talk more about as we go along. Um, so in terms of motivation, um, I've got some data here from uh, Ingersoll and Merrill. It's a little bit dated, but I think it, it makes the point clearly. Uh, there has been a greening of the teacher labor force in the US. The share of teachers with less than or equal to five years of experience in the 1980s was about 17%, and by 2008, it was 28%, and it's probably even higher than that uh, since then. So the question is, is this a problem, or is this a good thing, or a bad thing? And different people have different views about this. Um, one view is, it's fine to have lots of short-term uh, teachers. Uh, that view would be consistent with lots of empirical work by economists, including some by myself, that suggests that the gains to teacher experience sort of rise sharply during the first few years of teaching, but maybe level off after the fifth year. So if you had lots of relatively young teachers, that wouldn't be a disaster because you're not losing uh, the benefits from having terrific teachers who've been around for a while. But there's another view, uh, and that is that teaching experience is really important. Uh, that teachers continue to learn as they teach, and if we don't do something to encourage teachers to stay in the profession, um, we'll lose the benefits of that experience. So this, this notion starts from the view that is the view held by all of my friends who happen to uh, be in education schools, and that's not at Duke, because we do not have an education school, but when I talk to people who are in education schools, they say, of course experience matters. We all know that from reading David Lavery in, the, in 2000, from being in the classroom ourselves. Teaching is a very complex process, and it takes a while to learn. And that notion of complexity um, is one that makes a lot of sense to me. Teaching, I remember the first paper I wrote in the field of education had to do with accountability. I was editing a book called um, Holding Schools Accountable, Performance-Based Accountability in Education, and, um, and Cohen, what's his first name from Michigan? David. David, sorry. David Cohen wrote a paper there, and he used to talk to me a lot and he said, you know, Teaching is complicated. It's not like being a carpenter. A carpenter works on a piece of wood and can carve that wood or um, do with that wood what he wants. But a teacher is dealing with real people in the classroom. And those teachers, I mean those students in the classroom have their own motivations and reasons for being there or reasons to prefer not to be there. They're there because it's compulsory for them to be there. And that creates a a real challenge for teachers um, that, um, and, and teachers can learn to deal with various situations that arise um, by 
experience by seeing lots of those different situations and figuring out how to respond to them. So that's, that's always stuck in my head and is driving some of my interest in teacher experience here. But it's an empirical question, I think, the extent to which teachers continue to grow as they gain uh, years of experience. So why middle school? Um, well, if you look at the literature, the empirical literature, you'll, on, done mainly by economists, the type that I'm talking about today, you'll see that it, middle school really is an understudied uh, level. Uh, Doug Harris and Tim Sass have a summary paper that came out in 2011, and they refer to 22 studies looking at the effects of teacher experience and, and other aspects of teachers. Um, 22 of those studies were focused on the elementary school, and only seven of the studies focused on middle schools. <laughs> now, that focus on elementary schools is particularly apparent when you look at the many studies based on North Carolina data, and those include my studies with colleagues, Charlie Klopfelter and Jacob uh, Vigdor. And there's a reason for that. Lots of us like the North Carolina data. It's a great data source that is housed at Duke and that we've had since the mid-90s, and it's data on every single student and every teacher over time. It's a great data source, and it's made available through a research center so the data is cleaned and it's usable by researchers. The problem is, until recently, we haven't had a good way of figuring out which student had which teacher. And we could do that, we could make that match at the elementary school level roughly. Um, we knew who the proctor of each student's exam was and we could check our teacher records to see if that teacher was teaching math in that particular year, if it was a math test. But in any case, the point is we had to make some inferences from who proctored the exam. And we could do a pretty good job, we think, of matching teachers uh, to students, especially where the classrooms were self-contained classrooms, as they often are at the elementary school level. But we couldn't do that match very well at the middle school level. We tried, we being Charlie, Jake, and I in some of our early work, and we could figure out about 25% of the teachers, or maybe it was 25% of the students we could match to teachers. So we were not able to do that at the middle school level with the North Carolina data, and nor was anybody else able to do it. Um, at the high school level, we, we have one study looking at teachers and um, their effects at the high school level, but the high school level is a little easier because North Carolina has end of uh, course exams and we can take the teacher of the course uh, that the students were in. So, so we did one paper at the high school level. So, um, but it's now the case, starting in 2006, um, that we've been able to match uh, students to their teachers at the middle school. Uh, level, and that's what we're using in this study. I say using data from 2007 to 2011 because we have some lagged achievement terms, so we are using those five years that I've specified there. Um, so I've always, or for the last six or seven years, I've wanted to work at the middle school level just to complete the series of papers that I've worked on before, um, and couldn't induce Charlie Klopfelder and Jake to work with me on this because what was new about all of this? And my, in the past, we've looked at a whole range of teacher characteristics and looked at how those teacher qualifications related to student achievement. Um, we're one of the groups historically that focused heavily on qualifications. Another group, I would put Susanna Loeb and, and Wyckoff and company in that group as well. As you know, many people who look at teachers these days use value-added measures of, of some sort. I happen to think that uh, qualifications are worthwhile looking at, not for all purposes, but for a number. I teach in a public policy program, and I think about policy levers. And you know, policymakers do have some control 
indirectly in some cases and, and in other cases more directly over certain qualifications or cr credentials for teachers. Do they require teachers to take the licensure test scores? What are the cut points on that? Um, do they set up policies that would encourage teachers to have more experience or, or do they have a salary schedule that um, sends a different signal? So given my interest in policy, I, I like focusing on these um, qualifications. So first point here is to sort of finish, complete my studies, but in this case focus specifically on teacher experience. Um, the, the other reason to focus on the middle school is there are potentially some very interesting questions at the middle school. Now we don't go into them in great detail in this paper, but it's a, it can be a tough time for students as they're going through all sorts of hormonal and uh, social and all sorts of other changes. It can be a tough time for teachers uh, as well as they're dealing with the excitement of kids at the middle school level who are breaking away from the nurturing environment of elementary schools, but it also can be a challenge um, for teachers. So it just seemed like it made sense to, um, to focus here on middle schools. So the other element of the motivation is that there have been some other people who have challenged the standard view in this literature, and it's not the view of everybody, but I think if you asked a lot of economists who do some work in education but don't work in it all the time, or if you ask policymakers what the standard wisdom is about returns to experience, they would say, of course, novice teachers, no matter how good they're going to be eventually, are less effective than teachers who have a few years of experience, and that the returns to experience grow quite rapidly during those first couple of years of teaching, but then it does level off. Um, but there are at least two papers that I alluded to earlier, uh, or two groups, or, or three researchers in total, who have been uh, trying to think hard about this question and come up with some new modeling methods, and, and I'll return to those. Um, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to focus on uh, teacher experience, because I have something to contribute over and above some of the other work that I've done in the past. And then um, the other motivation is just the recognition that teachers can affect or may be able to affect non-cognitive skills. Now that word I'm, or description I have to be careful with. Have we got some psychologists here in the audience? Um, I'm using that very generally to re refer to a lot of behaviors or skills that people are increasingly thinking are important for children uh, to be successful after they leave schools. The, the reason for those of you who aren't, well, I guess you're probably all tuned into this, some of the non-cognitive skills that are, to which Heckman refers to when he uses the term non-cognitive skills do involve some cognition, and I'm certainly aware of that. Um, the key paper here is Kiribo Jackson in 2012. Um, his paper uses North Carolina data uh, for ninth graders, not middle schoolers, but for ninth graders, and he's done a very careful study of the, looking at measuring teacher effectiveness, um, both in terms of test scores, but in terms of these non-test score measures, and one of the nice things that he did is took each of the measures that he's using based on the North Carolina data and then using national survey data has demonstrated that some of these other skills that he's focusing on um, are important for life chances for, um, for students as they grow older. Um, so I like his paper a lot. One of the things that comes out of it is if you were to just uh, evaluate teachers based on the test score gains of their students, which is the uh, standard that lots of people have been pushing using value-added measures, you would miss a lot of what teachers are doing, because his paper shows that teachers are also contributing to, in other ways, to the motivation and character of students that generates outcomes in the future. And moreover, the teachers who are good at one, say the teachers who are good at raising student test scores, aren't necessarily the teachers who are good at doing some of these other things. So we were definitely um, 
intrigued by that and wanted to follow up. So the data we're using here is data on all teachers and students in North Carolina um, public schools um, during our 2007 to 2011 period. We've got students in grades six, seven, and eight, regardless of the grade configuration in the school. I mean, most students in uh, most schools have middle schools, grades six, seven, and eight in North Carolina, but not all. Sometimes six, grade six is in with the elementary level. Sometimes the school is seven through 12, and um, we know who's in what type of school, but we put all of those together, and we're talking about six teachers of students in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We've got about um, 250,000 observations per year and about 1.2 million students over time. Don't hesitate to interrupt me at any time if you have questions or something seems odd. Um, so um, there are two sorts of modeling issues that I want to start with. Um, one is the standard one that arises whenever we're trying to look at the effects of teachers, and that's just the fact that we've got a non-random sorting of students and teachers. Um, so there's some selection that we need to pay a lot of attention to in this modeling. And then the other modeling issue is the specification of the experience variables. So um, let me just illustrate with our data some of the sorting of students to teachers. So this is, um, I'm using one year of our data just for one grade. So this is seventh grader, I've got seventh grade students in 2010. And all I've got in this table is the proportion of students who have math teachers with particular credentials. So, and the credentials are all defined in terms of weaknesses. So it's teachers less than five years of experience. Those are presumably weaker teachers than those with more. Uh, teachers who graduated from an uncompetitive college, that's based on the Barron's rating, or who have licensure test scores. So those are the test scores of the teachers less than one standard deviation below the mean. So if you just look um, by race of students and look in that first column, the experience column, you'll see that black students have a higher probability of having a relatively inexperienced teacher, 38% probability versus 29% for a white student. And this is reflecting differences across schools and with schools. I simplified here to put them all together. Sometimes I do some of this analysis separately across schools and within schools. And if you go by free lunch eligibility, um, students who are eligible for free lunch have a 35% probability of having a teacher with limited experience, and that's um, higher than um, those who are not eligible for free lunch. I'm not going to do much in this paper with these other measures. I just put them here whoops, to, um, to show that the same patterns hold. Go over to this one, to the test score less than one standard deviation. So black students uh, have a much higher probability of having a teacher with um, a low test score, and it's more than double the probability that a white student has such a student, uh, such a teacher. And then you see the differences by eligibility for free lunch as well. So we've got, and this is something you all know, teachers are not randomly distributed across students, where the students are defined by disadvantage, in this case, um, minority status, or by eligibility for free or reduced price lunch. So there are sta standard ways to deal with this. Um, lots and lots of papers have addressed this. Um, we're going to use two models. In an earlier version of this paper that Susanna commented on uh, a while ago, we had five models. But it turns out you know, most of the interesting action and most other people just focus on two models. So in all, in all our models, we've got a dependent variable, which is achievement. We're going to look at achievement separately for math and reading. And by the way, as I talk through these models, I'm not talking about the other non-test score outcome measures. I'll come back and talk about those later. So I'm just focusing on achievement at this point. So we've got achievement for student I matched to teacher J in school S, in grade G, and in year T in math or English language arts. Um, 
And both models, we've got two separate models, include a vector of experience variables, so I'm going to have to come back and tell you what that looks like, and teacher and grade by year fixed effects. I want to highlight the fact that all the models we present here, with one exception, when I'm trying to show the effects of, of the including teacher fixed effects, we have teacher fixed effects in every model. Um, now that's important for you to keep in your head. What we're trying to look at is whether teachers become more effective as they gain experience. But we want it to be individual teachers gaining experience. So we want a within teacher measure. And the way we're getting that is by including teacher fixed effects in all our models. That differs from a lot of the earlier work I did um, at the elementary school level where we did not include teacher fixed effects. But they are definitely here. And then we've got grade by year fixed effects to, for the standard sorts of reasons. There may be some differences um, by grade by year because of differences in the way the state tests. I should um, emphasize, well, I guess you all know this anyway, I guess every state now has to test every student in grades um, three through eight, and they've been doing that ever since No Child Left Behind. We were actually in North Carolina doing it before that. Um, and our tests in North Carolina, I would say, are reasonably good tests in the sense that they're linked to the uh, statewide course of study. So we have a curriculum. Um, it's not really a curriculum. I mean, we have uh, something that we're sending signals to the teachers we want them to teach and pay attention to. I think that's important just to emphasize that there should be some linkage between what the teachers are doing, teaching in the class in terms of substance, and what's on this test. And that linkage is clearer in North Carolina than it is other states. Um, so then model one tries to deal with the non-random sorting of students and to teachers just by including a lot of um, background characteristics of the students. Um, and lagged achievement is in this model one, but then lots of the individual level control variables, classroom level variables so that we can distinguish the teacher effect from a classroom level effect. And then in this model one, some school fixed effects, because we know we've got non-random sorting of teachers across schools. So that's model one, and I'll spell it out uh, in more detail in a minute. Then model two takes out the lagged achievement and puts in student fixed, and takes out all the other time um, invariant characteristics of students and replaces those with a student fixed effect. So let me just present this here and talk about them a little more. So model one is at the top. I've highlighted that it's got a lagged achievement. TQ is a vector of, it's going to turn out to be teacher experience variables, and I'll talk more about that. XI is um, time invariant student characteristics. XIT is time varying student characteristics. Um, standard in these sorts of models for the time varying student characteristics are whether the student has just moved into a new school and whether that's a, just a, a move out of the blue or whether it's a structural move. Um, and then we have classroom characteristics. And then um, and we've got teacher fixed effects because J is for teacher, so theta J or the teacher fixed effect, and in this model we've got teacher, a uh, school fixed effect, uh, and then pi GT is the um, grade by year fixed effect. Now, that's a pretty standard value added model. The logic, it should be clear, if we're looking at the effect of teachers, seventh grade teachers, um, on seventh grade performance of students, we want to control for the prior achievement of the student, the sixth grade achievement of that student. This is standard stuff. I actually worry about it for a number of reasons. Um, as Harris and Sass and various other people have pointed out, that model, putting in the lagged achievement, um, is based on a number of assumptions. And we mentioned them in the footnotes to the paper, you know, like a constant de decay and a constant effect over time. Um, I think it's a reasonable way to proceed, but it's not completely free from problems. 
The other thing is the lagged achievement term is endogenous. Um, and it's endogenous whenever you've got serial correlation of the errors. But most people just ignore that and use that type of uh, uh, measure. And it will be one of our uh, models. And I think it's reasonable, but we don't know exactly which way the bias goes with that model. Now, the other one um, has the student fixed effects here. So that's key. Notice we've left out the lagged achievement. You could put the lagged achievement in, but it doesn't work very well when you have um, students just over a three-year period. If you're putting in a student fixed effect, picking up sort of an average effect, then you don't have a lot of variation for to pick up the time-varying lagged achievement. Um, and then we don't have, in model two, I don't have any of the uh, time invariant student characteristics because we've got the student fixed effects. Um, for a number of reasons that I spelled out in footnotes in an earlier paper, we expect the coefficients here to be slightly downward biased. When you have student fixed effects without the lagged achievement term, you get slightly downward biased effects. And Steve Rivkin showed that in a paper or an analytic note several years ago. If we were to make model two um, the dependent variable, the gain, the achievement gain, you know, achievement in this year minus achievement in the prior year, then we get upward biased estimates when we have student fixed effects. But in any case, I expect the results here to be downward biased. One nice thing about that is I know the I'm pretty confident, I never know anything in this business, that the results here are conservative. Um, and you'll see that I um, quite like this model, although we've got a variation on it as well. So let me turn now to the specification of the experience variables. So we've got an analytical problem. Once we've got teacher fixed effects in the model, and all of my models have teacher fixed effects in them, it can be hard to separate the year effects from the experience effects. So let's say you've got a teacher just teaching in the same grade I was teaching in seventh grade, and you've got year effects. Ours are year by grade, but that's equivalent. Um, so from one year to the next, that's a year, but it's also a year of experience. And so you've got a correlation there um, that creates a, a problem. So there are various approaches you can use to deal with this analytic problem of having teacher fixed effects in the same model in which you've got year effects. Um, and one approach is to just restrict your sample to, or to, to identify your effects from teachers who have discontinuous career paths. So those would be teachers who drop out for two years or one year or six months to have a baby or whatever, or um, for whatever reason, drop out and then come back. Now, you can do that, and Wiswall has done that, but I think um, I worry about that approach because those are not tip always typical teachers. And so you're identifying over a set of teachers that are not necessarily the ones that you want to generalize to. So another approach is to use experience bins. And what I mean by that is to, that you can just group the experience variables into categories. Um, no experience, have that be the base, and then one to three years, three or four to six years. Actually, it's not usually done that way. It's um, uh, up one or two years, and then three to five, or <coughs> six to 10, or whatever. And that's the way I've done it in the past. And lots of people have used bins for that purpose. But as Pape and Kraft show, and this makes some sense, there's a problem with that method. So when you have that method, um, you've got experience and you've got your year effects. And it turns out that uh, you're making, you're attributing too much to the year effects during the early period. So let's say you've got a bin. Let's have it be a big bin, one year to five years. During that period, we know that teachers are going to become quite a bit more affected during that period. That's what all the studies sh show. But if we put all those in a bin, we're basically assuming the effect during that period is exactly the same. So the year effects 
have to pick up too much of the burden. And what that means is the experience effects are understated. So, and you'll see that in some results I'll present uh, later. So it's not good to have these bins, especially during the early years of experience, when uh, experience, when the effects may be growing the fastest. So another alternative is to use the censored growth model. That's what um, Jonah Rockoff <coughs> uses in a very well-known American Economic Review paper back in 2004. And he, he recognizes this problem. And he says, well, let's censor our experience variables. So we're going to have indicator variables for experience 1 to 10. And then we're going to just assume there are no more gains in experience after 10. The advantage of that is you can then implicitly what you're doing is identifying the year effects from all of those teachers who uh, have more than 10 years of experience. So that's how you're separating these two out. And that method you know, seems to work reasonably well for him, but I don't like it because it caps the experience um, gains at 10 arbitrarily. So then Pape and Kraft come up with their preferred model. And this is the two-stage model. Uh, and they've got a, I refer to it as a 213 paper. I, it's under review. I don't think it's out yet. Um, but it will be soon, I think. Um, and this two-stage model, in the first stage, you estimate an achievement model without teacher fixed effects. So once you take out the teacher fixed effects, you can get just the year effects. Um, so you've got those. And then in stage two, you can go back in, take your captured year effects, and estimate your model um, with all your experience variables. And they quite like that model, and they call it their preferred model. And a few other papers have, have used this method and think it's the right model. But if you read Pape and Kraft carefully and think about it, you'll realize there is a slight problem with this and that they recognize. That this model uh, requires an assumption. It requires that there are no cohort effects uh, in terms of uh, teachers' contributions to student achievement. So if you took um, teachers who had 10 years of experience say in 2007, and then compared teachers who had 10 years of experience in 2011, which is the last year of our data, the assumption here is those teachers would be equally effective. There are two different cohorts. The ones that you measure in 2011 are younger teachers, because they're just getting to 10 years of experience in 2011. And so if, it, if you can't accept that assumption, the results from the Pape and Kraft approach are going to be downward bias. And I'll show you that in our analysis, because I will show you some um, um, two-stage results. Now what we do, and Pape and Kraft talk about this, is we use just a straightforward indicator variable approach with individual years for many years. And in fact, we're going to do it for um, Oops, I just messed up. Uh, we're going to use 12 experience indicators, just one, two, three, uh, one for each of those years, um, and then three experience bins, but our bins are at the high end um, when the returns to experience are going to be leveling off um, to a large extent. And so what we're doing is embedding those indicator variables along with the bins there, uh, into models one and two. And also, um, we present some results with the two-stage model, um, where the two-stage model is based on our model two specification, the one with the um, student fixed effects. Everybody basically with me? It's pretty straightforward, um, hope. So here are some results for math. So as I said, we've got results for model one, model two, and two-stage. We've got indicator variables. Now, our indicator variables are 1 to 12, but I've just put selected ones here. So it goes here, 1, 3, 5, 7. Um, and we also have a one at the very end, which is 28 or more years, but I didn't include that in this table. So if we look at model 1 for math, what we see 
is a coefficient for um, one year of 0.06. That's, this, these are all in standard deviations, so that's 0.06 standard deviations, and this is consistent with lots and lots of other studies. I'll return in a few minutes to how to think about the magnitudes of these coefficients, but that's a, that's a sizable magnitude. And then as we go up, we see the coefficients monotonically increasing, um, so from 0.06 to 0.10, 11 years is 0.17, uh, 13 to 20 is the peak there, oh, and 21 to 27 is even mm -hmm. um, higher in this case. I thought, I thought it leveled off there. Anyway, um, and then model two, the reason I thought it leveled off is I was thinking about model two. My preferred model is generally model two. So if we look at model two, we see the same, basically the same pattern with slightly lower coefficients, um, and then it does level off after 13 to 20 years. Model two. Remember, I told you that model two is slightly downward biased. I don't know which way the bias goes in model one. I can't tell you for sure it's upward bias. Um, so I like model two just because it's um, a conservative estimate. Then the two stage is based on model two, and we still we get a very similar pattern. Notice that the coefficients are a little lower for math. This is not going to be the case for English language arts, but all of these coefficients are slightly lower. We end up here with 0.1679 versus 0.1752. So we think these two stage results are downward biased relative to the middle column. And the reason we think that is we've gone and um, done some analysis uh, and to look at what the, to look at the assumptions underlying the Pepe and Kraft, and we've concluded that in fact the assumptions underlying their approach don't work very well for math. That in fact the younger cohorts have higher, for any experience level, so controlling for experience, let's say 10 years of experience or five years of experience, they have higher value added than uh, the older cohorts. And that's a point that I'll come back to later in a different form. And given that that assumption of Pape and Kraft, that those cohorts were the same, the Pape and Kraft two-stage model um, is likely to be downward biased. And as I say, they recognize that in some of their own work. Um, so let me show you the picture of this. Um, I need some help. Where's our, I don't know why it didn't show, oh, here it is, it's slow. Okay, so here are, the, here are the results. So these are model two results, which are the ones I like. If you prefer the model one, they would rise a little more steeply. So what we've got is just years of experience on this uh, axis, and I don't know why it says ADFP annual conference, it must have been an earlier <laughs> foot, foot, uh, footer that I put there, and math test scores in standard deviations on the left side. So this is just consistent with the figures I've shown you. Now I've got the 95% confidence intervals here as well. Um, you, you'll see uh, from those you can tell whether um, a teacher with uh, here, which is the middle of the thir uh, 13 to 20 years of experience, so about 17 years. Whoops, how'd that change? Um, whoops, let me go back. Uh, one more. Um, anyway, you can see that a teacher uh, in the with about 17 years of experience does look like uh, that teacher has a statistically higher uh, return to education than somebody with six or seven years of experience. Now I understand the standard deviations are big and some of these differences from one year to the next in experience are not statistically significant, but I wouldn't expect them to be. Um, so this makes some sense to a key <coughs> conclusion that I draw from this is if you believe this model, model with a teacher fixed effect, so we're interpreting this as gains to experience within teachers, um, then teachers continue to learn at least through, say, 15 years of experience. 
I don't know exactly what's going on over here. We've got somewhat smaller samples over there, and I don't want to put a lot of weight on what's happening on the right. But the key point is the gains do not stop after five years or seven years, which is what a lot of people think is the case. So that's math. Um, so yes, a sure. About the yeah. So for sixth grade teachers, the model doesn't include anything about it, it, model two doesn't, but model, model one, one does. does but yeah. model two, so you, you yeah. don't have anything there. So but it, it's got a student fixed effect. So right. we're trying to say, you know, something about the basic ability of the student. From their seventh and eighth grade, essentially. Well, sixth, no. From what their do you, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Right. Score. Right. But yeah. Okay. But if you prefer model one, go no, back no, to model no, one, no, and you'll, if you go back to model it. one, you'll get a steeper thing. But I know there are trade-offs here. But by not, in, you know, given I worry about the endogeneity of that lagged achievement in any case, um, I'm just as happy not to have it there, although conceptually you might like to have it there. So, so, the, so the gains keep going up, but really at about seven years, the, the gains get pretty small, so the additional. Yeah, so the biggest gain is in the first year of teaching. You mm -hmm. learn a lot in that but first year. Is yeah. Steep until about, what, yeah, and then it's going up. Years. Yeah, so it's still the case, so I have to be careful about this. It's still the case that the greatest gains are in the early years right. of teaching. That makes sense to me. So that's definitely, I'm not <coughs> saying anything other than that. I'm just saying, but teachers keep learning. Yeah. Um, up to say 15 or 17 years or whatever. Yeah, these, are, these are very similar to the results that you got with primary school. With private school? Primary. Primary school. Not quite. I'm, well, I don't have the el elementary school. Those of us in the U.S. will use elementary. When I'm in New Zealand, I call it primary. <laughs> but um, so, no, ours didn't go up <laughs> anywhere near um, as fast. We did not have teacher fixed effects. So they went up a little bit beyond five years of teaching, but not very much, but some. And our high school results, um, I think, leveled off really quite firmly. But if you think my earlier work generates the same conclusion, that's fine. That's the takeaway that I want you to end up with, which is that teachers continue to learn and to become more effective through a period of time much longer than five to seven years. So I'm sorry Rick Hanashek isn't here, because I'd be interested to hear his view um, about this, because some of his work, some of Tom Kane's work, all has it, uh, the gains leveling off after five or six years. We would argue against you on principle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, now. <laughs> Let's uh, go to ELA. So these models are similar. Um, there are a few differences here. Once again, the Model 2 results compared to the Model 1 well, are a little lower. But one thing you'll notice right away is the gains in student achievement as measured by student test scores, gains in student test scores, are much lower for reading than for math. That shows up in any study that I've seen, so that's not surprising. And there are probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of the gains in learning in English language arts reflect what, or a larger proportion probably reflect what goes on at the home level rather than the school. But there could be some other explanations, such as maybe it's easier to, um, to learn to teach uh, English or reading or whatever. Who knows exactly what the explanation is, but these results are pretty consistent with other findings and in the sense that the coefficients are a lot smaller. Now, there is one difference here. These two-stage results here, the first coefficient is lower, but these other ones are higher than they were in Model 2. And that's not inconsistent <laughs> with our analysis, our background analysis. I told you a little while ago that the Pape and Kraft assumptions break down for math. 
they don't break down anywhere near as clearly for reading. And that there's some footnotes in the paper for that. So, so that suggests, at least in reading, that maybe the two-stage method is the better one. Who knows? Um, but I'm going to move forward now using model two. Oh, this, uh, could you go back to the table for math uh, real fast? Yeah. Yeah, do you want to see the picture? Yeah. <laughs> if, you could, if you plotted these as first differences or something, if you care about growth rates, you could. Than the yeah. Point, I think you would see like you're actually getting the returns to experience for ELA are actually higher. Like. So as a percent or something, so the, so here, I mean, this is what they look like in terms of the picture. So we're going up pretty steadily, but notice the standard errors too. So when I'm here, I am higher the gains are greater than a teacher with five to seven years. But um, I wouldn't put a lot of weight on the specific coefficients or the differences from one year to the next. I mean, we've got big standard errors around this. Um, so. If you could fit like a, a polynomial through the, the point in year two, I think that the, the coefficient on the other should be steeper than the standard error. Whoops, what is it? Um, but I did a polynomial. I'm not going to do a great job over there. Maybe it will do something. I actually like the pictures better than the polynomial. But um, what, is there a discussion back here that you want to help me with here? <laughs> right. Anyway, so we do have these are much lower. It is upward sloping. Um, but this is, um, you know, we've still got the same basic conclusion. So now let me just compare these to what I refer to as misspecifications of the experience variable. So one model would be not to include teacher fixed effects, to leave it out. A lot of our earlier work, we did leave it out. That was partly because we didn't have as much computer power and all sorts of things um, 10 years ago. Um, and so this is what happens when you leave out teacher fixed effects. Um, you get not much gradient at all. If we look at math, uh, a little more, a little steeper with ELA. Um, but just focus on the math. And I put down here at the bottom what the relevant coefficient was in the other model when we had teacher fixed effects. So, um, so we go from 0.06 to 0.075 when we don't have teacher fixed effects and then we would go much, much higher. So that raises the question, <laughs> uh, what have we got when we got teacher fixed effects? And this is tricky because it would be nice if we had 17 years of data and I could assure you that we were looking at a similar teacher over 17 years, but that's not what we've got. We've got five years of data. So we've got groups of teachers um, that are contributing to this. Um, and um, so we worried about this a little bit. We worried about it in the past, and Susanna told us to worry about it more when she last commented on an earlier version of this. So um, here's our explanation. We think that low ability or um, teachers with lower value added, whatever you want to call them, are overrepresented among the more experienced teachers within our sample. Um, so we're interpreting that as a vintage effect. So um, when we put the teacher fixed effects in the equation, we're getting rid of that vintage effect. But when they're not there, we've got it as well. So we have provided some evidence for this. So we go back and capture the fixed effects for the teachers. And we see that the average fixed effects are lower for teachers with more years of experience. Now, I've just done this for a single year just pulled out 2008, 2009, but it wouldn't be any different for the other years. So for teachers with less than five years experience, um, so those are relatively young teachers, uh, new um, teachers, there's a positive average um, fixed effect or value added. And for those with greater than 15 years of experience, we have a minus 0.02 over here. 
Um, in an earlier version of this paper, we didn't go back and capture the fixed effects. We used another measure of teacher ability, which was uh, teacher licensure <coughs> test scores. And we have the same pattern. Um, the percentage of teachers with low test scores rises monotonically across uh, teachers with different years of experience. So low test scores is bad. So what we're saying is, um, or at least it's associated with weaker um, ability. So what we're saying there is the older cohorts are less able or uh, have lower ability. Now, I, it's important to emphasize this because some people look at our results and say, well, we didn't put teacher fixed effects in. We might have expected to get even stronger effects than, well, so let me say this the other way. Some people look at other studies and say, you know, it's not the weaker teachers who stay, it's the stronger teachers who stay. And there are a number of studies that show that, and we've looked at that in our data for just one cohort. I mean, you know, we can only do that for our 2007 cohort. We can look to see, uh, look at their value add and see who stays and who leaves over a five-year period of our sample. And in our sample, the less effective teachers leave at higher rates than the successful teachers. And that's consistent with other studies by Dan Goldhaber and a number of other studies. But we think the vintage effect is far outweighing that, and in fact, these measures that we report here would be even larger if we didn't have this mobility effect as well. So that's our explanation for what's um, going on there. So here's another misspecification of the experience variables. So this is using bins. So we've got everything else the same. That's our Model 2 result. And then we've got one to two years and just our bins here. And notice that, well, we've got a peak at 13 to, uh, well, peak at 6 to 12 years. Oh, I don't know, this negative sign is not right. That's an error. Ignore that. Sorry about that. Um, but in any case, we don't get this strong upward gradient if we use the bins. Now, that's consistent with the argument that I made earlier that we have a big downward bias because the grade by year effects so think of them as the year effects are picking up too much of the variation. They're picking up, I should have worded it a little differently, they're picking up some of the effects of experience in the early years, which then leads to lower estimates and then lower gradient overall. So that's what we think is, is going on uh, here. So we think lots of early studies, including my own, um, misstate the returns to teacher experience and they understate it because they don't have the teacher fixed effects in the equation. So, so now I might ask the question whether these effects are, are large or small. We don't do a lot with this, but we do compare the magnitudes to the, of our effects to the size of coefficients on some of the student variables in Model 1. Remember in Model 1 we've got lots of control variables that represent student characteristics, such as black or subsidized lunch, low parental education. All of those come in with negative coefficients, as one would expect. And we have other variables as well. So if we, <coughs> if we think about math teachers, according to the results I presented a little while ago, if you look at a teacher with nine years of experience, the coefficient is 0.15. I want you to keep that in your head. That's for math teachers. The coefficient for ELA teachers with nine years of experience is 0.06. So let's think about math first, that 0.15. And here are coefficients of selected student variables for model one. So if you're a black student, what this says for math, there would be a negative, you'd be, have performance below a white student of minus 0.06 uh, standard deviations. If you're subsidized lunch, so that fourth row there, one, two, three, four, um, be minus 0.05. Um, so if we you know, ask the question, does experience, having nine years of experience relative to no experience, is that a big effect? Well, it's big enough for math to <coughs> offset the effects of being black and, and being on subsidized lunch. If um, 
holding everything else constant. Now, if I add in one of these education variables, let's say the parent is a high school dropout. I've got a minus 0.08 here. The teacher experience isn't, is not enough to offset the combination of being black, being on subsidized lunch, and having a parent with very low education. But I'm not arguing that experience can offset all of these effects, but it just, for math, it does seem as if these effects are reasonably large. Now, what was the coefficient that I told you to keep in your head for ELA? Minus 0.06, Minus 0 .06. okay. Uh, we got a little more of a problem over here. <laughs> so, the teacher experience is not enough to offset the black disadvantage in reading, which is huge, minus 0.11. Um, it might be enough to offset just the socioeconomic disadvantage, controlling for everything else, including black. Um, you know, we've got some big effects down here for um, college education. It's a, it's a little bit smaller than just ha having the parent be a high school graduate compared to being a college graduate. So my view is, you know, the effects of experience in math are really reasonably substantial. Um, in ter if we use this method of comparing reading, less so, but again, that's not surprising. It's consistent with all the literature that says a lot of what happens with respect to language arts and stuff happens in the home and not all in the school. Martin. So, um, it would be useful, actually, doing this exercise that you just did, to, because in the very beginning, you showed a table if you were a, a black student or a lower associate, right. you, you're more likely to have a younger mm -hmm. So it would be useful to know sort of what the probability of having uh, for these groups, since you pointed them out, for like, let's say black yeah. students. Right, so okay. what is So what average experience teacher do they have? Right. And what would be by raising it by yeah. a certain amount. So that's, let me hold that a little bit. I, I've got, I want to go through the non-test scores, and then my very last slide is going to say, what are the policy implications of this? And that's, and, and I can alert you to what that slide says. It says, let's discuss. And I'd really like to hear your results, I mean, your discussion of this, um, to put it into a policy-related um, context. So. We can come back to that if you wish. Let me um, turn to the non-test score outcomes. So it's now about 25 of 5. I want to, I think this will be much quicker going through, but I do want to leave time for general discussion at the end. So in the North Carolina data set, um, we have a number of measures, not as many as we'd like, but the four that we have that I can look at are absences, and that's absences from school. It's not absences from a single classroom. It's offenses, and the way we've measured, the way we've defined offenses, it's inappropriate language, disrespect, insubordination, disruptive behavior, and skipping class. Lots of types of offenses that might be affected by teachers, by good teachers, because they're classroom sorts of offenses. Um, we've got time spent on homework, and we have free time reading. That we're, um, and we're only going to link that to ELA teachers. So let's start with absences, because that's where the result, so the closest. But I want to alert you to the fact that we've got pretty big standard errors in these, and so there's a lot more uh, uncertainty here. So the measure we're using is reported by school administrators, so it's in the records. Um, it's not student reported or teacher reported. It is the absence from the school, not from an individual classroom. So it's not skipping a reading uh, an ELA class or a math class. And clearly, absences are non-normally distributed. We've got some kids who have lots of absences and then lots with less than three absences during the year. Um, so that distribution worried us for a while. In a first pass at this, we just use total number of absences for an individual student. Um, and we got some big effects on absences, but we realized that wasn't right, and that what we really should be doing is estimating a Poisson distribution. 
but we couldn't figure out how to do that with all our fixed effects and just possible. So we ended up um, looking at the distribution of absences and realized that 10 absences uh, is at the 75th percentile of, st of student absenteeism. And so we're, our main variable is the probability of having more than 10 absences. Now we've done it for other measures, so we've tested the sensitivity to this, and I can talk about that. And we've just got a linear probability model. Um, so let's look at the results. Um, this is the math sample. So we've got years of experience here. Absences are a bad thing. We'd like to have absences go down. So the, the question we're asking is, the teachers with more experience, do they get better at keeping kids in school? Now, we might not have found anything, because remember this absence variable is a school, it's an absence from school, not absence from this particular um, class. So the fact that we've got a pattern here at all suggests that something is going on here. And I understand with the San Francisco data, you've got people who are going to look at skipping classes. And I think that's a useful thing to do. Um, but anyway, so we've got pretty big standard errors, but it, we've got a uh, reasonably clear. Did you look at this, um, the school fixed effect? I had just played with it. It was Miami data, similar things to this. But it was a lot located by school and not by teacher when I looked at it. So we've got student fixed effects in this. But in this model, I think we've done this for model one. Model one does have school fixed effects. Yeah, so. Yeah. I should go back and check that. I'm pretty sure we've done we've done lots of variations in all the model, and I don't think um, we just wanted to be consistent throughout. But that's a good issue, um, and I I think it looks the same. But but let me check that. So that's a good issue. So that's the mass sample. Looks like it's down so there was a lot of jumping around in the beginning, uh, in the early years. Here is the ELA sample. Uh, it's going down when we get to these very experienced teachers over here. So our conclusion from this, despite all the noise and uh, you know the um, senators, is that it looks like teachers with more experience are uh, better able to keep kids in school than those without. By the way, we worried a lot about this issue. We've got a math teacher, but it's a school level variable. We've got an ELA teacher, and it's a school level variable. And some of our models, we tried to put both in, then we had averages, but averages don't make any, averages of teacher experience just don't make any sense at all in this context. And then once we, if we wanted to put math teachers and reading teachers in, we couldn't have teacher fixed effects in there. Um, so this is what we ended up with, and I hope it's plausible and interesting. Um, so then we have these other measures, so reported offenses. I mentioned those earlier. Those are offenses that sort of happen pretty much in the classroom. Now, they're reported by all the teachers, not just the teacher, the ELA teacher, or the math teacher. So these are reported at the school level by all the teachers. Um, and what we use as our main measure is the probability of at least one offense, but we've done it for more offenses as well, but the numbers are reasonably small. Time on homework is a categorical variable that we made continuous by changing it to minutes, but you know we could have estimated that in various different ways. That's reported by the student. It's not subject um, specific. So none of these measures are perfect, and we, we understand that. And then time spent free reading is a categorical variable um, that's changed to minutes. That's reported by the student. And we model that just for ELA teachers. And we think there's some reason to think that ELA teachers might help students be curious and make them want to read more. Sorry? Yes? What, actually, just that, that if you believe that that's a good exclusion restriction, why not the, the math teachers as well? It's kind of a yeah. As I said that, I thought, why didn't we do that? And we, we haven't. Mm -hmm. So um, we would expect to say see a smaller effect. Although if we found a, the same effect, then I could tell you some story that math teachers get their students excited about learning and all things. But I agree. I agree fully. Good point. Um, so here's probability. Oh, now I'm going to present the ELA results one after another, three of them in a row. And I'm going to and then go to the math results. And the reason I'm doing that is to the extent that there are effects here, I think they're slightly stronger for ELA. 
I mean, there's a lot of noise. Um, and that's a, that could have some policy implications. If, if math teachers are better at raising test scores that we use for evaluating teachers, but other teachers are doing some good things, um, maybe that's useful to keep in mind. But, you know, there's a lot of variation here. So that's offenses. I don't know what's happening for the early years of experience, but it's reasonably downward sloping. This is time spent on homework, a lot of noise, a lot of variation, so they're not statistically significant one from another, they're statistically significant from zero. Um, but uh, this is upward sloping, um, so that's what we would expect um, if teachers, as they gained experience, were better able to encourage students to you know, settle down and do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then I'm at, amount of time spent free reading, and this is just the ELA uh, sample. So that's generally upward sloping, but again, a lot of noise, and I don't want to oversell this. I'm most confident about the absence uh, results. And now if we go to math, uh, here's offenses, that's the math sample. We don't see much um, across time. Amount of time spent on homework, um, don't see a lot. Oh, and I don't have free time reading for that, even though perhaps I should have. Um, so this is my last substantive slide here. Um, so what conclusions do we draw from this? Um, the one I want to emphasize is that teachers continue to learn on the job. They gain from experience beyond the first five to seven years. I can't tell you exactly when it levels off, but I think this is an important finding um, and that seems to be inconsistent with uh, what some other people think is the conclusion and it's going to, when we come back to the policy, it's going to say, well, you know, how can we take advantage of that or how can we promote that learning on the job? But the second point is also very important. A typical teacher with a lot of experience, even in the North Carolina <laughs> sample, is not necessarily more than affected than a typical teacher. I'm now talking about averages. We know there's going to be a lot of variation around the average, but if we just focus on a typical or average teacher with a lot of experience, that teacher is not necessarily much more effective than a, one with a few years of experience because of the vintage effects. Now that's going to be relevant as we think about policy. If we've got a situation in North Carolina where we've got a lot of teachers who've been around a long time, um, and I probably should have made this point earlier, so let me make it now. Why might we have a vintage effect in North Carolina? We are a fast-growing state. Um, and we have gone from a state that didn't put much emphasis on education to a state that, until recently, until two years ago when we changed governments, put a lot of emphasis on education. And during the relevant time period, we raised teacher salaries. We raise standards for teachers coming in, and most people looking at North Carolina from outside would say we've done a terrific job until two years ago in uh, raising the standards for teachers. So when I say there's this vintage effect, that's reflecting the North Carolina context where some of the older teachers were there for a long period of time and came in under the old guidelines and then we raise standards and, and raise um, salaries. So, but this is an important point um, because maybe it suggests that it might make sense to let some of those older teachers go because they're lower basic ability teachers and then focus on the new ones. But this is why I want to come back to that. And then the role of non-test scores, um, you know, I think we do have reasonably consistent evidence for the absences, so the point I'd like to emphasize is that teachers matter not only for raising achievement, which gets all the publicity because of all the value-added models, but because they do other things as well. We've picked up just a few other outcome measures, the ones we happen to be able to measure in the North Carolina data. Clearly, there are lots of other things that experienced teachers do that we haven't picked up, like they mentor younger teachers. They have, if they stay in a school for a while, they have the history and the 
and the mission, and they sort of maintain that mission over time. So um, I don't think in this study or in any study that I've seen uh, have we picked up all the things that experienced teachers can do. Um, but I do think it is important to emphasize, or at least we've shown that there are some evidence that they do do these other things. And then I think the other point that comes out here that I alluded to earlier and that also showed up in the John Jackson paper is it could be that the ELA teachers do more of these non-test score things in a slightly better way or that experience contributes more to their ability to do that in ELA than in math. Now we don't have strong evidence for that, but again that's important if we start thinking about how we're measuring the effectiveness of teachers. The more weight we put on the ability of teachers to raise test scores alone, the more we may be doing a disservice to the ELA teachers who are doing other things. So it's suggested on that. So as promised, this last paper, I mean this last slide says let's discuss and um, I'd like to open it up and I mean there are lots of things we can discuss, role of, it's policy and I'm in a policy school so what, what does this mean for TFA, what does it mean for uh, salary schedules, shapes of salary schedules, um, what does it mean for all sorts of issues and I'd be interested in your views. Yeah. So you're talking about the absences? So we've got to be careful about apples and oranges here a little bit because it's test scores in math or test scores in reading. And then it's, so maybe you're right, but it's absences from school, which may show up in lots of different ways. I, I don't make a lot of that distinction because I would argue that we don't care just about student achievement in math and reading. And if we can get kids in school and staying there, maybe they're learning some art and music, and maybe they're learning other things that aren't here. But anyway, I don't want to go on a one-to-one -one comparison here, but maybe you can convince me I should, and that from a policy perspective, that's what we should be looking at. So, so how do you do that with salaries? You say, okay, well, okay. the older teachers aren't very good, so we don't want to put the, the salaries up there, but teachers get better with experience. So we just want to kind of start with high salaries right now and continue there. <laughs> yeah, well, so this is, this is the question I want us to think about, because I don't know exactly what this means for salaries. Other, although you'll see the wording in the paper, um, I don't, discuss salaries in this paper, I've discussed it in another presentation. My first starting point is we need to get, attract high quality teachers. That's the first thing I say. And then I say these results, then say, and then we want to work with them to develop them and we want to keep them in the classroom. So those are the two points that I usually emphasize. Now, but then I have this problem, that second point that I had, you know, do we want to, what do we want to do with those other ones? But, but on the first point, if we want to attract high quality teachers and we want to send a signal to the high quality teachers that we want them to stay, we've got to have salaries that somehow are high enough initially and also rise over time in a way that's appropriate for college educated uh, workers. So if lawyers are raising, earning additional money over time and somebody's thinking about going into the teaching profession versus a legal profession or just whatever other college educated profession it, it, it says, you know, if we want them to continue, we've got to have those salaries high enough initially but also continue to, to increase. If we hadn't found this returns to experience. You know, if it really did level off, we could say, let's have high salaries initially, and let's not care if 
and we don't need to care if teachers leave. This is not a profession, and we don't want people to compare it to other professions as they're making their decision whether to invest in the training for education. So I think there is something here, but I would like some help. And, 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 uh, yes? I'm wondering, I'm just curious, because you put emphasis on the older teachers or the leveling off for the senior teachers. Right. I wonder whether there is... It's not for the senior teachers, it's I mean, the earlier cohort of right, teachers. Right, or the more, the more the experience. So I'm wondering... And it's not just the more experience, yeah, it's the more experience because they're an earlier cohort. So yeah. my projection would be as the younger cohorts gain this experience, they would be good. <coughs> That's my hope. Yeah. Okay. So I was just wondering with the bins, you know, the, the, the old, I mean, the, there are bins now starting at a certain level of experience, and I wonder whether you, if you instead look at those year by year and, you know, have the bins early on, you know, I wonder what the, I mean, if there's something that even would be interesting. So I, I'm not sure I fully followed what you say, but I'm limited. I only have my five years of data. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I've got, so I'm putting, I'm constructing my graphs um, by having some teachers are contributing to the bottom part of the graph and some to the upper part, but when I have teacher fixed effects, I'm controlling for teacher ability yeah. and effects, so I'm, I'm matching up all those parts, but I can't go back and sort of look at each group of teachers because I just don't have enough power uh, to come up with something interesting there. Yes? Teach for America. Or teach for Chile. So my, yeah, my question goes to the, we are considering here that all the teachers from the same grade and they are kind of equivalent. So what happens, I don't know if you have enough data to separate initially to make a different line for the ones who start with uh, high value added or whatever measure of high quality we have are no quality, and see how they grow, they go grow the same way, and if the low ability ones. But I only have five years. Yeah, but even in five years. Yeah, like so I can that, see a little bit. The problem with just going for five years is, so the only ones I can look at, well, if for who come in new in 2007, those are new teachers in 2011, I've got them for five years, now we know lots of those are going to leave and there's a lot of turnover and stuff, so I did sort of mention that. But now I can look at, so you want me to look, let's take the teachers who in 2006 had 10 years of experience. But I can't, I can look at their value added and see what happens five years later, um, but it's still just a... The main question would be whether five year growth I, it's more than the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher with the same experience. Uh, okay, so now I, can I say something about that from the numbers I have? I mean, I think I can just compare a teacher with 15 years of experience to one with 10 or one with 10 to five, and I, I think I could do that just with what I've got now. And that's another way to ask the question and maybe you know, an additional area that I should look at about how big these coefficients are. Um, is the gain from seven years to 12 years of experience sufficient to offset um, something else? Interesting point. Yeah, right, right. Yes, Tom. Yes. You often hear people argue that it's hard to predict teacher quality ex ante, much easier to predict it ex post. So, Say a little bit about teacher tenure policies in North Carolina, their substance, and particularly their timing. One thing I noticed was that the ELA teachers there reported offenses jumped in year four. So I was willing to place a bet that they were tenured after three years. Yep, that's what happens. So it's different from California. It's not your crazy system of after 18 months or something or yeah. two years. So that is exactly right. We, as of uh, this. How, what is it now? As of last spring, we got rid of tenure in a complicated way. So we're, we're experimenting with that. I mean, one of the reasons for me to be interested in all of this is, uh, you know, there are a number of people in our state who think tenure isn't needed. We don't need these experienced teachers. And a lot of the teachers I talk to say, 
boy, would we be losing a lot. And so this is trying to shed light on that question. Um, but let me just ask, so is there any other part to your question? So you've got the four-year tenure that decision. Right? That is, you were right <laughs> on that. And that's a good point. I didn't mention that, uh, or I hadn't thought about it in this context. This, your study period spans the period before. The yeah, it was before, yes, yes. So it's not until 2014 that we're getting. Is it, is it a typical situation where 95 plus percent? Yeah, I mean, that's what, well, so, but you have to be careful about that number. I mean, everybody says, you know, most teachers get tenure, but a lot leave. And I also told you that the, it was the weaker teachers who leave. Um, and so if I just look at the period, Teachers coming in in year one and use their value-added estimates. It's the weaker teachers who are leaving. So, so when you tell me that 98% of the teachers get tenure, I'd say that's 90% of 8% of the teachers who were there that year they came up for tenure, but it's going to be a lower percent of the ones who started. So I think we need to pay attention to that. So any other... Thoughts? Yes? It seems like the policy implications are, you know, very North Carolina specific. So it should be about <coughs> continuing to build on the initial investment in teacher quality. So rather than, you know, sort of arguing about big ideas, is it new teachers or older teachers, what you're, especially with this vintage effect, um, what you're really showing is that the investment made a big difference and this is really promising for the future oh, if good. we can um, keep these teachers, but it wouldn't necessarily be about a, you know, across the board um, raise in salaries because the decision point at five years of experience or 10 years of experience of whether or not to leave the classroom would look really different. So you'd have to think about sort of why people leave after five years. Maybe that's more about, you know, this salary is untenable for, <coughs> Maybe after 10 years, it would be um, very different. Maybe it would be more about um, salary and working conditions. So, you know, the kind of differences, the kind of policy um, changes you might make would look, would look different to keep different kinds of things. So I picked up on the first part of what you said, which you might not have wanted to emphasize so much. It looks like these investments <coughs> that this state made in the past worked. We've got better teachers. Now, so one way to follow through on that is to say, boy, it would be a mistake to move away from those policies. So those policies included, for example, um, trying to bring average teacher salaries in North Carolina up to the national average. We're now 48 just the last two years, I mean, big, since the recession, and, and we're now losing teachers right and left. So one interpretation of this is to say things worked well during that period when... Um, so this, I think it's not really narrow, if you say we have better teachers now, because like, that also implies you know, we're slower. Oh, no, not necessarily, because North Carolina gets a lot of people from out of state. Uh, so it, Oh, we get lots. We're a growing okay. state, Hessel. <laughs> I don't know, but you, you see what I mean. Like, it, it depends on what these people do to other ones. Yeah, it might, but... If, so. I take your point. I don't think it's all that relevant for North Carolina at this point. But anyway, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to discuss that uh, more. Um, we know each other from Amsterdam, and um, so we'll have to, we'll have to discuss that. But North Carolina has been a growing state. But the other thing is, North Carolina's may, growth may slow down. Who knows? Um, so the other way to think about this is if we're not going to raise average salaries as much as we did at certain times in the past and raise standards, what is it we can do at this point to, to maintain as high a quality teaching force as, as possible? And I would argue that one thing we need to do is to invest in these teachers, that we've got all these new ones I and mean, the young ones. We want to give them opportunities to grow. Um, now, not all of them will be good, but on average, um, that may be the way to go. And so we need to think about invest, investments in them, giving them 
opportunities for professional development, making sure school principals work with teachers to get them the assistance they need. Um, so I think that's one conclusion that could come out of this. Martin. Actually, your, the NAEP scores in North Carolina slowed down a long time ago. Well, they slowed down reading. Um, it went way up for a while, and then they slowed down. Some of that was because of the rapid increase of Hispanics um, and no, no, changing mix. I, I estimated justice scores. You've got they justice scores. Okay, so there's. Yeah. So it's an interesting question why they went up so fast to start with, yeah. and then why they started. Yeah. Well, Sonny, I don't, I don't want to end the conversation. I'm just going to interrupt it because mm -hmm. we're at okay. time and we continue outside with the <coughs> reception. So this can all continue, just not in this forum right now. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you very much.